I'm Carson Cristiano. I'm the executive director of SIGA, which is the institutional home for BITS at UC Berkeley, Center for Effective Global Action. Uh, it's so wonderful to see everybody here today, many of whom have been around since that first meeting that Ted mentioned in 2012, <clears throat> almost 10 years ago. Um, we're a very small but uh, mighty and dedicated group, uh, very interdisciplinary group met to talk about study registration and pre-analysis plan, pre -analysis plans and very quickly realized that there was so much more that could be done to improve the credibility of, of empirical social science research. So the presentations that you're hearing today and also tomorrow really illustrate how far we've come towards this goal in the past decade. Um, and I'm really proud of not just our BITS team, but this whole community uh, for staying really focused, uh, for leading by example, which is important and for driving a real uh, meaningful change. <clears throat> so now I'm delighted to introduce our keynote session, which will be a conversation between two economists who have been particularly influential in this march towards transparent and re reproducible research. Uh, Ted Miguel, who you've already met, <clears throat> is SIGA's faculty co-director. He's the founding director of BITS and author of the award-winning textbook on how to do open science. Uh, Ted is going to interview David Card, also at UC Berkeley, who made us all very proud last year for being a co-recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. That was for his empirical contributions to labor economics. So Dave is the class of 1950 professor of economics and director of the Center for Labor Economics and the Econometric Lab here at Berkeley. He's done really important work on wage determination, education inequality, immigration, and gender related issues. His contributions have really challenged norms in economic research um, and have profoundly changed what it means to do empirical work. Uh, Dave was also awarded the John Bates Clark Medal in 1995 and served as the president of the American Economic Association last year in 2021. So Ted and Dave, please take it away. Thanks, Carson. And again, Dave, just want to welcome you uh, to the fifth annual meeting. It's really just such an honor to have you here today. My pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, I want to uh, start with just uh, a little bit of, um, you know, giving you a chance to talk about the background in our field and in the social sciences. And <clears throat> I want to kind of motivate it with a quote that we sometimes use in the open science community that people, uh, people sometimes use. Richard Feynman, the famous physicist, actually wrote about open science. He had some pretty, you know, he was pretty entertaining in general with his writing. And he had this great... Um, a commencement speech where he wrote, um, the first principle as a researcher is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. Uh, so I just wanna start out with, you know, when you were getting started in the 1980s in economics and, and thinking of that, that era, were economists, was the economics discipline basically fooling itself with its empirical research? And how did your work help to, to, help to deal with that? Um. Well, I think it's actually probably pretty hard for most people to understand, but um, I usually explain the situation this way. When I was a grad student, um, I, we read a bunch of state-of-the-art papers and presented them and stuff. And most of the presentations would kind of stop when we got to the empirical work. So pe people, first of all, the data was pretty thin uh, and no one really expected that that was the most important part. The most important part of the paper was the methodology and um, the theoretical modeling and maybe the econometric setup. And so people didn't, for the most part, didn't take the, the numbers too seriously. Um, and so that was pretty much the state of the art, I think, in most areas of economics. There were a few exceptions. One, one exception was in some branches of labor economics, there, there were a few um, scholars who, really took uh, quantitative um, things really seriously. The, the kind of the father of the field of modern labor economics was a, a guy at Chicago named Greg Lewis. And he had been Gary Becker's thesis advisor, Sherwin Rosen's thesis advisor, Walter Roy, many people's thesis advisors. But he himself didn't write that many papers, but he was very um, well known for taking empirical results very seriously. And as an example of that, when someone presented a paper and he was in the audience, uh, you would say that my results passed the Lewis test, which meant that he didn't like erupt at you and tell you how crazy it was. And I had the great honor when I was a uh, first year PhD student of working as his research assistant. 
he was visiting Princeton. That, yeah, he was visiting Princeton and um, he was trying to re redo all the papers. He was writing a big meta-analysis. And most of the papers didn't have um, any statistics in them about the sample size or the characteristics of the populations of interest. And he couldn't tell. And so I was basically taking the existing data sets, which at that time were only a handful, PSID, NLSY, CPS. And I would try and create the data set that probably was used by the author by trying to read through the papers. And so that was my first experience in realizing that most people didn't document what they did very carefully. Uh, anyway, so it was it was a much different world. I mean, that that's so ahead of its time in the sense. Well, now we we've been pushing so much for data availability and and code availability, but at that time, like you said, it just there wasn't even the internet. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't readily. You had to get tapes, data tapes, and and they were only held in a few places, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, it, there were logistical challenges, but um, people weren't making any effort really to share either. It wasn't like you know, it was it was logistically hard, but there wasn't even any underlying effort to do it. it just wasn't yeah, there was, it was also there wasn't a standard software. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, to tell the truth, like there, there was a, a very early version of TSD available that was well known for not inverting matrices reliably. I see. <laughs> Sounds like a problem. <laughs> yeah, things like that. There wasn't a standard, uh, you know, we didn't have a state or anything like that. And um, so it was really pretty primitive. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, you raised the issue about theory and the importance of theory. And, and I guess, you know, related to the emphasis on theory is the fear that somehow ideology gets to be um, sort of front and center. I mean, you know, there's a difference between a intellectual discipline driven by ideology, hopefully, and driven by scientific facts or driven by driven by data. And, uh, you know, how do you feel that the field was then or, you know, in terms of this uh, let's say battle between ideology uh, and, or you know, faith and science. Let's say uh, in economics. Um, I think it was probably worse then than it is now. Um, it was. There had been. I think. I think it's important when you, I've thought about this a little bit in writing my presidential address for the American Economic Association and the evolution of ideas about wage setting power by firms, and. Um, I think it's kind of important to understand that in the 1940s and 50s, there was this huge ideological battle about whether the you know, market system was going to was good or whether the, you know, some kind of basically mark, uh, government controlled system was good. And that people felt like they were fighting that battle uh, in the 1950s. And if you read Milton Friedman's writings and things, you, you realize that there, there was this huge battle. Basically, the kind of the right wing side won <laughs> that battle, I think, and, and, and in economics. And so by the 1960s, many of the ideas that were more widely held in the 30s were kind of pushed aside, for instance, wage setting power or even monopoly power uh, of firms. That was when I was an undergraduate or graduate, early graduate student, we didn't really talk about price setting power very much. The field of I.O. really was kind of a mess and didn't really, there wasn't really a empirical analysis of, of that kind of issue. So th things have opened up quite a bit. Um, and part of it was also data needs. You know, you can't really study interactions of markets if you only have one side of the data, which you oftentimes only have with, with data from uh, household surveys. Right, right. Um, I'd like to ask you, Dave, about some of your other early experiences with uh, replication. You just mentioned your RA work in grad school, but you know, th so that was one experience trying to replicate. What were some of your other early experiences with replication, and how did that experience affect your own your own research? Um, one one thing I would I would maybe mention was um, something that had made an influence on me. I don't think it had as much impact on the field, but uh, in the 19, 1984 85, these two or three three people. Um, tried to take all the papers that had been published in the Journal of Money, Credit, and Banking and reproduce them. And so the, and the JMCB had started a policy about halfway through their sample period of requiring people to make their data available. So there was sort of an, you know, growing interest in that idea. And so they tried to, they went to the authors and requested the data sets and they, they were, you know, singularly unsuccessful in actually even getting data sets. And, Eventually, they tried to reproduce the results, and of course, 
some of these were most of these were time series studies and some of them were fairly elaborate, you know, requiring, you know, iterative procedures that would take all night to run on specialized software. And this is the early 80s. So this was, a, you know, much slower exercise than it is nowadays. Um, so they, it, it's published in the American Economic Review. And Ashenfelder, my thesis advisor, and by then my colleague uh, had asked me to re- as one of the referees of the paper. And so I read the paper very carefully and, um, uh, you know, Orland and I talked about it. He eventually decided to publish it. And it wasn't very well received by the economics community. It was, it's hard to explain what, what I think the reaction was, but it was something like, well, that's not a very good journal. And most of these papers are not very good. And the people that write them aren't very good. And, you know, it's it like an elitist, a kind of elitist response. Yeah. And, and the really serious scholars in the field don't do this kind of work anyway. They do, you know, they do theoretical modeling. So why, do, why is this a criticism of the field? And Orly had been for a long time been pushing uh, the idea of like, you know, we'd need to have more replication and we need to have a little bit more credibility. And, you know, that was very influential at Princeton where I was and, and what kind of work that people were doing. But this was one of his first attempts to try and bring this matter to the attention of the field. I don't think it had that much impact, but it, it, it made an impact on me. I, I may be the only person who remembers the paper. Well, I think, you know, for those of us in this community, I and mean, like when we when I was writing up our, our textbook with uh, with co-authors, we, we saw that, you know, we see that as a seven, as a key event. I mean, you know, it's, it's sort of among those who are trying to look back and see when things started to change that DeWald et al. paper um, is seen as influential. And if it affected your research or affected the the way the labor group at Princeton evolved, I think that's uh, that's already pretty big, uh, pretty big. Impact. Yeah, I, I would say one thing. Coming out of that, there was one small thing that happened, which is after Alan Kruger and I did our study of minimum wages in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, we made the decision to um, post our data. And, and at that time, there wasn't really, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the internet as it exists now, sure. but there was FTP. So we had our data set sitting on an FTP site. And we had a little note in our paper and in our book that we you know, have this on this FTP site, which right people downloaded and used and it was a very transparent you know simple data set to use and people used it for um teaching exercises i think and that was one of the first ways that you could post data it's really hard to imagine how difficult it was to post data back then, yeah 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 no that, that was again a uh, huge step forward um just speaking exactly about this issue of sharing data and code i mean you, you did this early work you and alan and sharing your your data what um, you know, what did you, um, what do you see overall as the value of, of posting data and code? And also what did you learn as head of the AA in this past year um, when the AA updated its data, data availability policy? So I, I basically just asking about how you see, the, you know, these norms changing and what the, what the value is that you see in, in, in the AA kind of continuing to push these norms forward. Well, the AER uh, had had a policy since the mid 90s of requiring people to post, quote unquote, post data. Um, and it, it was not particularly successful because there wasn't any quality checking or not very much. And so you could kind of just post something. And to, even now, I think a lot of journals have a fairly laissez faire, you know, you, you submit some code and a an assistant for the journal looks and it says, okay, it's a file. It says it's a data replication file. We put it on this website, but it doesn't really help very much. And somebody pointed to me just the other day, an example of this in the Journal of Human Resources, their their replication site, there's one of the um, archives says, well, this data is all, um, you you can't get it publicly. So that's it. (laughs) So that's what the entire replicate, no, no computer programs, no nothing. And this was a paper that they published last, last year. Um, so this is still going on, but the AER, AEA has invested a huge amount of money. Lars is Lars here, Lars Hoover. Um, Lars is running a team at Cornell, which is working for the AEA, trying to reproduce as many of the uh, data set, uh, results as possible for papers that are being published in the AEA journals. And that is a very costly enterprise. Um, you know, in all honesty, it's costing the association close to half a million dollars a year. So most journals can't afford that. Uh, and so it, it, is a, it is actually a challenge to have this. It's a great service. And uh, I have some personal experience, for instance, with their team. I had a paper published recently used um, uh, data from Brazil. That's a little bit hard to get. Brazil is relatively open. 
so they managed to reproduce the results using a, a special version of the data set that they were retrieved directly from Brazil, which was you know nice to see. But I think I think the investment that's required, most of the journals can't do that because they don't have that kind of funding. You know, we're cross-subsidizing this from other things in the EEA. And I, I don't really know how that's going to work out in general for the other journals, because most of them are running pretty shoestring budgets. Yeah, um, yeah for sure. For yeah. sure. I mean, one of the one of the things that we are hoping from the social science reproduction platform that they were talking about, you know, colleagues were talking about earlier today, which is an attempt to crowdsource computational reproductions, is that this will be a way for other scholars, for grad students, for others in the community to basically check uh, code and data that's been posted and get a sense of like, how reproducible is it? I mean, is, is it, you know, a 10 out of 10 or a five out of 10 or, you know, where, where is it in between? Just because like you said, so many journals don't have staffing for it or don't have resources for it. It seems like such an important public good for our community, but then the question is who should fund it? Yeah, but it's extremely time consuming because, you know, for instance, the New Jersey, Pennsylvania study, that's like a, you know, 400 observations and a bunch of regression. So you could reproduce that in five minutes. Yeah. But a lot of papers are actually, especially in economics these days, are extraordinarily complicated. Yeah. There's a, you know, amazing amount of computational sophistication going on. Um, you know, there's some hand holding of the code, maybe in some cases even. Yeah. So I, I don't think that, the, you know, the state of the art papers are something that is easy to reproduce in many cases. Yeah. Yeah. From start to finish. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I think the hope would be that, um, well, there's such a range in the kind of work that's done, but um, uh, if if researcher, if folks doing computational reproductions can can focus on key pieces of the code and put a lot of effort into those, then maybe they can make progress. So, uh, right. I mean, there might be a way that um, if you're doing a complicated estimation, that you could pr provide some kind of statistics that would allow you to say, okay, you know, if you have these statistics, then this is more or less the sufficient statistics for the for the project or something. But in many cases, it's not. We're not there yet in terms of computational methods. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I see actually a question in the chat that's very uh, relevant to this issue about replications. And so Bob Reed has asked uh, you, Dave, would you advise early career researchers to do replication work and try to publish it? Or is it too risky for them? Um, and if it, if it is risky for early career researchers, can senior researchers be counted on to support such replication efforts? I'm just curious what your view is of the field. Of course, you know, I know... <laughs> about the all the you know our colleagues and grad students at Berkeley have been doing lots of replications over the last uh, you know a uh, couple decades but what's what's your uh, take on whether this is a good idea or well you be doing this work I had been kind of excited about this idea in the 90s and um, got a few students to do some projects like this and the somewhat well-known studies but it, it it had a fairly high cost on the, on the students who did the replications because um, in all honesty, it's not very popular to, um, you, you're seen as, a, at least at that time, I think you were seen as a second level scholar, or possibly an ideologically driven person if you tried to reproduce something and found that there was a problem or an issue. And, you know, it's easy to turn a, a criticism about the data into um, some kind of a personal attack on the author, the, and at least the author can make it seem like that. You know, it's basically the same way politicians <laughs> deflect criticisms. Um, so I, I would be very cautious about that, and I, I, I no longer advise students to do that. I think, um, I think it's important, but I don't know that it should, I think that the burden shouldn't necessarily be felt uh, held by you know young people at the beginning of their careers because the cost can be somewhat high um, and it would be I think fairer if the burden if there was a burden to do you know to check papers and so on that that, that would be done by more senior people who whose reputation and, and careers would not be slowed down because they happen to find out that some well-known researcher had a paper that doesn't quite hold up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, this, I think this gets back to the, the platform we were discussing earlier. And you know, my hope looking at this uh, now is that 
it feels like there's a culture problem in our field and other social science fields that, you know, legitimate attempts to reproduce results sometimes lead to such huge backlash. And you yeah, know, I mean, that, I would say enough that, of it, then norms can change if enough people are doing it and it just becomes totally normal that there are just thousands of these reproductions posted every year on a public website and just becomes the norm that your paper gets reproduced, then it doesn't have that same burden. If you're like the first one to do it, like what you're saying a little bit, Dave, is like, you're the first one to do it. You're like the nail that's sticking out and, and you get kind of hit, but maybe we can make this the norm. Maybe we can change our, you know, our view of what we are as a science. At least that's, that's the hope behind these, these platforms. Yeah, I was gonna say that I, I although we, I think economics is actually leading, I, I had the, you know, as, as president, I had to talk to some other groups of people that were kind of interested in what we're doing. And I think what, for instance, what the largest group is doing for the AER, and the AEA journals is, is really state of the art. And if you, like medicine is just hopeless. And they, they don't share any data. Um, it's well known that, you know, you can't get high profile and impactful studies. You can't get that reproduced um, you, because they won't share the data. And so I, I think we're in better shape than a lot of other fields actually. Um, and I, so I don't think we should be, you know, too, I think we should, we should feel fairly good about where we are and not be too self-critical, but it is difficult. Um, if someone has, you know, written a paper and then, you know, made a mistake or found, you know, something was coded wrong. I mean, we're all familiar with coding errors. Um, okay. And, and then sometimes there's a choice that can be made and, and, you know, you'd find that of all the choices, there was you know one out of ten that led to a certain result, and nine out of ten that was insignificant or something. That's helpful to know that, but I don't think people like that to be revealed <laughs> about their own work. So you have to be thinking about that when if you send somebody down the path of asking them to reproduce a paper. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that that view. Um, let, let me switch gears a little bit and talk about a related issue, but a, a little bit of a different one, and and, and that relates to publication bias, which is something that, you know, has long been seen as an issue that, that threatens credibility of, of research in the social sciences and beyond. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, part of, uh, you know, what's happened in recent years is a rise in, in a number of, of social science fields, including economics, the rise in meta-analysis. And I wanted to ask what you've learned from your own experience meta-analyzing meta economics research, including work you did sort of ahead of the curve when it was much less common for people to do meta-analyses, sort of what motivated you to do those meta-analyses and what have you learned? How, how do you see that uh, branch of work in, in the social sciences? Well, I actually think uh, surveys of the literature, you know, especially well thought out surveys of the literature, maybe a little bit less just purely meta-analysis, but some combination of meta-analysis and, and anal analysis of methodology and kind of assessment can be extremely important. And those papers are well, very well cited. Um, and for example, in most other fields, the annual reviews are amongst the most cited journals and uh, articles in the whole field, like in sociology or uh, other fields like that. And it's starting to be a little bit more like that in economics as we get you know, more and more research. So I think, first of all, just to say, I think doing synthetic papers that try and summarize where we are and what we've learned is very helpful and, and um, should be thought of as not something that is done you know just by you know, you know narrow set of people but is a central part of the field um so the the first meta analysis i did was one with alan kruger we, we summarized the literature on minimum wages and that was a terrible literature um it was well known that it was a pile of junk um there and um we figured out a way to essentially construct an early version of a funnel plot it wasn't quite that way, but that's what more or less what our results did. And, um, you know, I don't think that was too surprising to most people who knew that literature, but that literature was one of the weakest in all of economics. It was still using time series data methods, which, you know, time series in, in labor economics got relegated to back pages in the 80s and justifiably so. So I think that was kind of exceptional, but it needed to be cleared out. And so, we, we realized that there was a simple way to do that and that's help get people started and subsequently 
found other examples. I think, for instance, the other area I've done meta-analysis is in active labor market programs, training programs, and there, there isn't very much publication bias. We've, uh, we've I've done some studies, or even there isn't that much bias between experimental and non-experimental studies. And I think the reason is that in that particular area, there isn't really an incentive to find a result that's one way or the other. If you, if you do an analysis of a training program and show it has a zero effect, that's actually a finding. So where the, I think that you can kind of figure out where's the concern about, about publication bias. It's where having a positive effect or a significant effect is actually um, important for whether the paper will be published. And there are lots of field, you know, lots of examples in, in our field of, of areas where somebody, you can, a, a grad student will come into my office and say they want to think about a study. And I always ask them, well, is this one of these one-sided studies that if you find a significant effect, it's a paper. If it's not, it goes away. And I, I wish we could reduce such papers in our field. And when when those are the when that's the situation, and that's really what's going on in, for instance, in sponsored drug trials, the results are really, you know, the the, the drug gets approved if the efficacy study shows something, right? So there's enormous amounts of dollars at stake. In our field, there's not so many dollars at stake usually, but there there is a you know sometimes a situation where a null result is not important. Um, and I think that that's really the fundamental lesson I've learned about replication is you got to think about it case by case. If, if um, a finding of, um, of a zero or wrong signed effect is interesting or uh, um, could be accepted by referees as something important, then you're not going to have so much problem. But if it's all one sided, then you will. Yeah. I mean, I remember you talked about your early paper, David. I remember teaching your paper in a course a few years ago and just seeing that like the T stats on all the published literature at exactly 2.0, you know, it's just a striking. <laughs> right. Kind of and shocking many people figure. have written that paper, right? Our T statistics too, there's, a, you know, there's clusters of too many T's totally. too and stuff. Oh. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. continues, unfortunately. I mean, even in, some yeah. recent, in recent work. Yeah. Uh, there's another question from the chat. Let me just bring in, this is from Fernando, our colleague at BITS. He says, um, you've written elsewhere that the idea of a research design came from your experience looking at medical journals in the 80s and 90s. And then Fernando says, a subsequent development in those journals later on was the standard, standardization of reporting uh, using reporting guidelines. What do you think about bringing that concept of reporting guidelines into economics uh, papers? Um, well, I just, I just have a paper coming out in the British Medical Journal, and they have these kind of weird ways of presenting stuff. Um, I did not find it natural myself to put it in those that framework. Um, I mean, they are in their in their fields. A lot of these fields, the papers are very short. Um, there's almost no, you know, discussion of the data and stuff. There's amazing. Almost everything's in appendices. We're the opposite. We've got these enormously long and getting longer every year papers with more and more detail. And so I think we have more flexibility in our field as long as it's transparent and clear um, for people to do something a little bit outside the, outside the box. So maybe in certain areas, having these, these um, constraints is, is good. I mean, it would be nice if referees said, okay, we've got to have a table one, which shows the means of it and how you derived your sample or something like that. Um, and I, I, but I'm not sure I'm not sure that I would be an. Ad I'm not usually an advocate for rules uh, of any of any kind. To tell you the honest truth, I'm not a rule person. I mean, norms have evolved for sure. I, I think your reaction is similar to a lot of economists. Of course, in other fields, I think people, at least the medical researchers I know, would say these days they can't even conceive of writing a paper without going through the guidelines. It's really just structured the way papers get put together. You know, our, our papers are different, um, you know, in our fields, um, you know. Well, we we have model-based, we have a lot of model-based papers. Yeah. And, and a model-based paper is fundamentally different than, a, you know, a, a RCT. Yeah. And, you know, fundamentally in our field, I think model-based papers are still pretty important. Um, probably, you know, more important than RCTs on average. So we have to have a way to talk about model-based uh, data analysis. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I think that's right. There's 
more heterogeneity in the style of empirical analysis. And so, you know, one set of guidelines just wouldn't work beyond yeah. that type of paper. And yeah, no, I mean, I think that's, that would be a limitation, mm -hmm. um, you know, for sure. Um, another uh, question I wanted to ask Dave um, extends in a little bit of a different direction. This is the link to public policy. So, you know, part of the reason a lot of us go into the social sciences, go into economics is we, you know, we want to contribute some useful knowledge to society. We want to have a positive influence on how maybe public policy evolves or society um, evolves. And uh, I just wanted to ask you about your own experience with the evidence to policy link, the kind of work you've done that's sort of directly trying to make those links between the research you've been doing or you and colleagues have been doing to policy and um, you know what you see as the barriers to bringing credible social science research into changing uh, public policy. Well, I think there are some areas where the research has small effect on public policy. I, I guess, for example, the active labor market program area is one like that, where um, there was a, a, there's been a pretty consistent movement to try and understand what kind of programs work for what kind of clients and, and um, push. Um, this is a, not a big deal in the United States, but this is a big deal in Europe and other countries and try and push the direction of a, of the programs in a way that seems to be more closely aligned with what the findings have been. Um, an area where uh, I would say the impact of public policy uh, of research is almost nil is immigration. Mm -hmm. Very important topic and, um, you know, public policy probably, uh, you know, going to influence the elections coming up in the United States and, and many other countries in the next 10 years. Um, and I think economic research there has been virtually um, unimportant. So I think you have to really think about your topic and, and say, you know, is it, is, is public policy even remotely uh, affected by what the scientific findings are? Yeah. I mean, you can kind of see this with COVID. Mm. One problem is it, it, COVID is in a way an evolving set of research problems uh, in front of our eyes. And we see, you know, big debates amongst the people uh, who are doing the research on what exactly the right findings are. And so it's, I think the one result of COVID may be that um, expert opinion is downweighted even further in the future. Right, well, you're saying like it's an unsettled field, there's new evidence coming in. So it isn't even clear that there's a consensus among the experts. So people say, guess, well, forget yeah, those guys, you know, well. I can see two experts from UCSF on, on my local news station arguing opposite about masks. You know, like, what am I supposed to do about that? But, yeah. So I, I think, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on minimum wages, people sometimes say, well, minimum wages are, are now, you know, being used more. Right. Kruger and I did our paper, but did our book in the 1990s. And then we, we always used to laugh that for 10 years that nothing happened on minimum wages. Um, I'll, I always like to tell people the, tr the sad truth, which is that um, uh, Princeton Press published a lot more printed a lot of versions of our book and they had to throw them in the trash. <laughs> oh, no. oh, but that, well, that proved, proved to be very influential, Dave, <laughs> eventually. It's so incredibly cited uh, and influential now. I know you've also done work on uh, different um, social programs in Canada, like the Self-Sufficiency Project through the years. And I wondered if you had thoughts on that experience and was the link between evidence and policy different in Canada versus the US or sort of what was your experience you know, with your research there? Uh, well, SSP would be a good example of a policy which probably, or a, a, a big research enterprise that probably had almost no impact, to tell you the truth. Um, it, the, the one branch of the government, the federal government in, in Canada wanted, was at that time interested in, um, uh, you know, like an, an enhanced uh, EITC kind of program, basically that's what it is, or a negative income tax. Um, but um, it kind of failed. The results came out in the 1990s, just about the same time that we were rolling back welfare in most countries, including you know, Clinton welfare reforms and so on. So that at that time, there was really no interest in expanding benefits and making programs more generous for low income people. So it fell on deaf ears. It, another really important thing about SSP, unfortunately, it was an example of a large social experiment that it, subsequent research by um, my friend Craig Riddell and, and, and some co-authors suggested that 
uh, there's a lot of problems in that experiment with um, contamination from other program changes that were going on that were affecting the control group that really were not fully discerned by people like me who are involved with the original research. So it's a bit of a humbling experience to see how badly screwed up some of our results were. Thanks. Um, uh, I want to turn to another topic, Dave, which is kind of looking forward. You, so you've been involved in replication and meta-analysis and dealing with publication bias now for decades, and, and you know your work's had so much influence. When you look forward to the next steps that economists and other social scientists need to take to make our research more credible, like what would the you know, two things at the top of your list be. If there were two either policy changes or changes in norms, changes in practices, two things you'd want us to do as a research community, what, what would those be? Like, what's the frontier right now, in your view? Hmm. Um, well, I think more work on, you know, exactly the kinds of things we've been talking about here. It started off the conversation with trying to make sure that everybody is submitting research papers with, with very well-documented archives. A challenge for that is the growing importance of administrative data sets, which can't be shared. So I think figuring out how to solve the problem of having reproducible research that uses um, secure confidential data sets is, 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 if somebody can figure out how to do that, that will really make a huge difference. Um, because it, basically in my field, at least, uh, re the, the research game is who's got the best new data set uh, and, and can, you know, address questions. And that isn't, you know, sometimes that's a bit of a, a strange combination of private incentives and, and others to, you know, go out there and find a data set. And then it isn't necessarily strong incentives to then make it available to everybody else. So I think we need to, to resolve that, that conflict. But um, I mean, the latest AER data, I mean, I, this is based on some, some data that we've gotten from the AER. I think in recent years, something like 40% of empirical papers use some sort of confidential or restricted data. That was yeah, my, and I, I think so it's still not a majority, but it's like it's been going up the last 15 years. It's just like inching up. So um, yeah, and if you just focused on labor economics, it's probably like 60 or 70. Yeah, the the years, the, day, the days of, of a, you know, a paper an influential paper using current population survey data or census data is, is very narrow, you know, very much numbered, I think. Um, so I think we need to solve that problem. Um, and it's closely related to a problem that um, is, is also emerging, which is that governments are having a lot of problems with surveys and are having a lot of problems releasing data that may reveal confidentiality. So people might not know this, but you know, like the age values on the current population survey are all imputed or jiggered. Yeah. Uh, and more and more data is being triggered by the um, producers of the data to prevent confidentiality issues. And, and we're going to need to start building that into our uh, processing procedures. Yeah, I know. And I know there's been some controversies even with more and more census data now, like you said, being um, synthetic or being, you know, being jiggered. There yeah. is a, a comment in the chat here says, that says, um, do machine learning based synthetic data sets hold promise for this issue? I guess this is at the, the privacy issue, Dave, that you're talking about. Yeah, well, there is some, yeah, I, I, there is some work, I mean, a lot of work in that. Um, I don't fully understand all of that. It, it is very technical. Um, and whether, you know, the, I, I don't know whether the, an average user can even possibly understand it, to tell you the truth, the way it is right now. It's so, so technical. Yeah. Um, that That's a concern I have with that, yeah. Yeah. I mean, one advantage, I think, of what's been going on in economics is a lot of important research is really straightforward. Mm -hmm. You know, an RCT, simple difference of differences kind of things. And those kind of studies have ha had much more impact than people really thought they ever could. Mm -hmm. And um, that's really uh, at the same time as, on the other hand, the state of the art in certain fields in economics is becoming massively complicated modeling. So you got those two conflicting sides of, of what we do in our field that need to be kind of, they're fighting out all the time. Yeah, no, it's right. And, and you know, you're coming at this from the perspective of labor economics, from my own perspective in development, where most of us or a lot of us are collecting our own data, our own surveys, that data gets posted. A lot of folks are using RCTs, which have, you know, they're, they're, there's research designs with some complexity, but 
it's usually relatively straightforward to, to kind of understand where results are coming from. I would say like the change in my own field in the last 20 years has been very positive in my own subfield. There's yeah. more data availability, better data, better designs, um, but that's not necessarily the case in IO or some other fields, which are you know very model based. Right, or the or the fields that are really driven by the expanding things you can do with admin data that really can't be made available to other people. I mean, you can share the codes and things like yeah. that at least. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's an interesting comment here or question uh, in the chat, Dave, and this is kind of a bit more of a, a big picture question about incentivizing these practices. It says, are there ways to structure tenure and promotion criteria to incentivize open science practices or de-emphasize practices which encourage questionable research practices? Now, I know you were recently chair of our department, so maybe you have some, some thoughts about, about this process. But again, if you were you know, the provost or the dean and you could change something about tenure review, is there something that you think we could do to promote Good research practices. It's a hard question, I think. It's a very hard question. I mean, I think um, academia as a whole really goes with the you know the kind of crowdsourced <laughs> uh, evaluation method. So yeah. we basically say someone is important if everyone in the field thinks it's important, or some research is important if everybody thinks it's important, and. Um, Sometimes people will think that something is important if it's even if it's based on data that isn't easily obtainable by other people or um, based on a methodology that's not that easy to reproduce. But ordinarily, I think on the end, it will have to in order for something to be important, it's going to have to have follow on. If it has follow on and it's empirical, it's going to have somebody's going to have to do something you know, to follow it with further research along those lines. So I think there's a self-disciplining nature of it. You can't, you know, you can't be, a field can't get started and one person kind of has a secret data set or it is that it's not available. That, that will then come to an end. Yeah. Because you can't write any more papers about it. Yeah. <laughs> so fundamentally, the thing that keeps this kind of honest is that we always have to write papers. Everybody needs papers to get promoted and, you know, they need more papers. So, and they have to be new. And so that means if somebody or some field is getting stuck on some, you know, deep secret thing that no one else can reproduce, yeah. that's kind of the end of that <laughs> in the end. Well, I mean, it speaks to the, the lack of maybe citations they would get. I mean, what you're pointing to is how being open with your data and your code and whatnot leads to follow on work that yeah. leads to citations, which is one of our central metrics of influence, right? It gets back mm -hmm. to this notion like, you know, that's a summary statistic. Uh, you yeah. Know, I mean, to tell you honest truth, another thing that's true is if you, if you make your data available and it's, it's kind of cleverly done, it gets into the textbooks. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, if somebody has a, a really nice study with, you know, Jeff Woolrich will put in his textbook and then the next thing you know, there's, you know, 100,000 people around the world that have estimated that model for you. Um, and that has a huge impact on them when they go to grad school because they've seen, seen your work. Even if it doesn't get any citations, they've seen your paper or something and they kind of think about things differently. So yeah. you can have a very strong indirect influence, I think, by making available your data. Yeah, yeah, you're pointing to some of the values, even the private value of transparency. You know, we we often focus on the social benefits, but you know, you're saying even privately, people may have this, um, you know, the, the, this this benefit. All right, so we're at the point in the talk where we wanted to open up fully to questions from the uh, the audience. We have about seventy people uh, on, so I just wanted to. Uh, Folks, feel free to put questions in the chat. I'm, I'm looking at the chat um, right now. I see a couple of comments from Lars, I guess, David, about what we were just talking about mm -hmm. um, and um, saying that more data, are, there's an increase, this rise of, of data that's not publishable, as you said. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I think he's maybe less concerned. He says, the number of papers my team sees each year that are really hard to access um, is very small, maybe 10 out of 500. So there's, there's some papers that are hard to access or hard to reproduce, but for the most part, it seems like the team and the AA is, you know, able to, to yeah. you know, access a lot of the data and, and reproduce a lot of the code, which I think is encouraging and sort of a hopeful, yeah. hopeful development. Yeah. I mean, I think, 
the one really good thing about it is if somebody is saying to you, you will publish your paper if you can provide the code and let their team reproduce it, you will have very strong incentives to be creative and approach the person that provided or the agency that provided their data and say, can you provide a version of that 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 team can use? Yeah. So they're, they're, that really aligns the incentives. <laughs> yeah. Instead, without that, the incentive is, ah, you can't get the data. Isn't that too bad? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, well, let, let me take my prerogative, uh, since I'm, I'm chatting with you, to ask you a question that's sort of been on my mind and on the mind of a lot of people at BITS the last few years. This is kind of a big picture question, um, which is what role do you think there may be, Dave, for pre-registration and pre-analysis plans uh, going forward in non-experimental work. So in experiments and RCTs and development now, it's the norm to write pre-analysis plans. And you know, there's different degrees of detail that some people have, but the, the kind of norm is pretty well established, less so in some other fields. I think in lab experiments in economics, less so, but you know, in parts of social psychology, pre-registration has really taken off. So, you know, pre-registration is, is, is kind of uh, you know, being adopted in some communities, but the bulk of empirical research, at least in economics, is still observational work. It's not mm -hmm. you know, RCTs. And there, there are some examples of, of pre-analysis plans that I've seen, but you know, they're pretty rare. Do you think that you know, going forward, that would be, it would be a good development to have greater adoption of, of plans and pre-registration for observational work? Um, and if so, kind of yes or no, you know, why or why not? Or where do, you, where do you think this could be a useful tool to spread beyond, say, development RCTs or beyond some lab experiments? Uh, I mean, I th it's potentially possible to do it. Um, I, I, to tell you the truth, I'd be very, if, if it really became a bare, like a thing that you had to do, then wouldn't, wouldn't there be a strong incentive to investigate the data, see what you're, what you're going to do, and then announce a rep your, your plan and then just do that. That's the, concern. That's, that's the, that's the concern. concern. So I, I don't know how we completely solve that problem. I think the, the bigger picture thing, which I would emphasize, is if the research question is such that whatever answer you get is interesting and a, a zero or a negative or a wrong sign or something is, is fully appreciated and acceptable, then I don't think this is nearly as big a problem. The, the problem emerges in these one-sided type tests where there's like, this is only a paper if you find that some behavior that you posit is really true and otherwise no one cares if you don't find it. So I, I think we, what we probably could do for non-experimental studies is try and lean more towards that perspective and say, evaluate this paper by asking, would we even be talking about this paper if they didn't show this result? Yeah. And if that's in cases where we'd say, well, it's not a paper unless they have a significant result, then we really have to use very, very high standards of evidence, you know, the T statistic, you know, the eight sigmas or whatever kind of thing, which is more what they do in physics. You, you know, you can't say that you're, you know, finding a result unless you're way, way out there in significance. Yeah. I mean, so I that, that would be my solution to that uh, in the interim. And, and, you know, we could try and get people to, to do some posting of ideas or projects, but I think it's going to be extraordinarily hard to monitor. Yeah, you know, my, my sense, having written pre-analysis plans now for several years, is it is very useful ex ante to go through that exercise and think through what is the, what are the range of results I might get? What, what's the kind of data or the tests I'd want to run? If I get a positive, negative result, like, mm -hmm. you know, it, it makes, it, it's at least made me think through things at a deeper level before even launching into data collection, which, which actually can improve the research. Um, again, the big concern is the one you've raised about if the data is already out there, it's already publicly available. How do you prevent people from <laughs> analyzing it and then registering a plan? I, the, the approach, the, the type of data where this could be readily applied would be, you know, cases where it's still a prospective study, even though it's observational. Like the data hasn't been released yet. The data isn't available. Um, mm -hmm. The event you're studying hasn't occurred yet. You know, you can imagine in political economy, the election hasn't happened yet. Well, what what analysis am I going to do two days after the election on this, you know, on these voter returns? Or something? Yeah, I think those would be feasible things. So I would say in defense of the other style, I mean, probably most of my papers that are, a lot of my papers are basically inductive. So I started 
playing around with the data and, and uh, realized that there was something there that I hadn't thought of before that didn't make sense. And I don't think we want to discourage that. Purely deducted, you know, research where you say, okay, I got a hypothesis and then it does it. I think that that would be an awfully limiting thing for our field because we don't have very good, you know, we, we need slightly more complicated things in null hypothesis and not null hypothesis for understanding equilibrium and things like that that's a little more complicated than just a treatment effect. Yeah. And I think we, we want to encourage people to get to really understand data and the institution they're studying and maybe uncover something that hasn't really been fully appreciated before. And that should be a part of the scientific process. Yeah. And so I don't want to discourage inductive research. I, I think in fact, in my field, it would be better if more people really did that said okay here's the data what are we do what are we looking at here and that for instance in research that people are doing now with worker and firm data that has really turned out to be quite important yeah yeah one of the things that i think you know in the transparency community we've flagged as important is just understanding what type of research we are looking at so if folks are doing that kind of work as long as it's clear that that was the research process that's totally legitimate, valuable, et cetera. I think we have this tradition sometimes in the social sciences of doing all that work and then you know, writing the paper as if- Yeah, that hypothesis <laughs> that one at the test start. Was, yeah. <laughs> was the, the <laughs> hypothesis you had you know, three years before. And in fact, there was a lot of exploration that went on and, and that exploration is great as long as we know there was ex, you know, exploration that went on. And, uh, so it's, it's, it's again related to transparency. I do see that Alex, you've raised your hand. Do you have a question, Alex, you wanna jump in on? Yeah, thanks, Sid. Um, so in BITS, we, we try, we start almost all of our trainings with kind of like reflection on the scientific ethos and the Newtonian norms. And one of the norms is universalism, which holds that the claim should be evaluated based on the empirics, based on the data, not who's making the claim. However, whenever there's analysis that are super complicated and very math heavy and, and difficult to understand, people are, are almost forced to rely kind of like on the credentials of who's making the claim rather than the validity of the claim itself. So I was wondering what your thoughts were on this and um, yeah, like what is, what is there any, if there's anything that we could um, pre, pre do to move away from credentialism towards actually appreciating the claims for, for what, what they are? Um, well, I think, I actually think that we have less of a problem with that in economics than most other fields, because in reality, we are counting on the new PhDs to do the overturning research. The, the, a lot of the most innovative research is the brand new PhD students. We're putting an enormous burden on our PhD students to come up with some new paper and some new project, and it has to make it into a top five journal, their first big paper, which, you know, you don't do that in physics or chemistry. You work as a, you know, postdoc, your years as a PhD student, you're just basically, you know, working on projects that your advisor gives you. We have a very different norm. And so we're counting on the young people who aren't necessarily coming with these huge reputations and big labs behind them to, to do most of the overturning work. Uh, so I think that's great. I think that's really big benefit of our field. And it, it makes it very exciting, but very high pressure for young people. That somebody who's you know 30 years old and just finished their PhD a year or two ago can have one of the most important papers published in the field. And that happens year after year in our field. So I think that's a big difference that you should be thinking about with us. Uh, you know, old guys like me, you know, no, no one's expecting us. We're supposed to write the review papers and stuff. We're not supposed to be doing the overturning research. So I don't think we have quite that challenge. I mean, the, the, maybe the place that that's the most serious is in these um, big lab settings where there's a, a really important data set that is um, not necessarily easily accessible. And there's a lot of, you know, Medicare records, for instance. So you, in order to use Medicare records, you have to have $400,000 grant from the NIH because they just charge an enormous amount of money. So the ordinary grad student can't do that unless their advisor's got Medicare records. Uh, and so that, 
but that's just a government that that's really in a way the government's screwing up the research community in my view because they're just charging them for those records that cost zero to reproduce but that that's an example where i think there is a bit of a danger of that but in most other data sets you know a grad student can go and get the data from you know finland or sweden or germany or something and, or collect a, you know work on a team and do an rct or something i think i think we're we're actually pretty and no one loves it better than you know than economists when some young person comes up with something that kind of trashes the old guys so we have a great ethic of you know overturning the old guys is really great and i think we should just keep that ethic Right. Okay. Well, we're almost out of time. We have maybe two or three minutes left. Uh, so I just wanted to give folks in the audience a chance to jump in with any further thoughts or reactions, um, questions. Uh, I have a question for you, Dave. Are you going to get to go to uh, Stockholm next year? Are they? Is this thing you're going to get to take part in all the the Nobel party and everything? Uh I'm not sure. I, you know, to tell you the truth, I wouldn't mind missing it. <laughs> <laughs> not my kind of thing. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, do you have any last words or thoughts, uh, Dave, that you want to share with? Well, no. I would say that I think it's great to have a community of people that are so focused on these issues, and um, you know, your your groups. Uh, this group's. Um, presentations and, and kind of indirect influences really help the AEA find the willpower to raise the half a million to keep the <laughs> keep Lars's enterprise going. Uh, and so I think, it's, you know, it, all of this stuff is costly and uh, we have to make sure that the elders of the field fully understand that it's worthwhile. So Great. lobby your lobby your uh, AEA executive committee member. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're working on it. Thankfully, a lot of them are at Berkeley, so yeah. you get to talk to them. <laughs> Great. Well, anyway, I, I really want to thank you, Dave, for such a stimulating, uh, thoughtful discussion. And I'll just kind of lead the round of applause here. I'm sure everybody, uh, you know, feels the same. This was a really special opportunity to to 